on the agenda committee is uh, you've uh, received minutes for January 12th, 19th, 20th, and 26th. Uh, any, uh, do I have a motion, Representative? I make the motion to adopt the uh, minutes. The motion by Representative Helgerson, second by uh, uh, Representative Delperdang. Does it, are there any other uh, discussion on that? See none. All in favor say aye. Aye. Opposed, no. Motion carried. Committee will open the hearing on House Bill 2504 and uh, ask the revisor to uh, give us a briefing, please. Thank, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, committee House Bill 25. 04 would require a service connected disability be a physical disability to qualify for a disabled veteran distinctive license plate. Uh, so, House Bill or KSA 8 161 provides distinctive license plates to disabled veterans um, as they are defined in 8 160. Um, the license plates allow for certain parking privileges, such as parking in any uh, handicapped space or zone, parking in a meter zone with no time limit, parking without charge in a, in a handicapped space in a public parking facility. Uh, the definition for these license plates, uh, for anyone who uh, meets that definition, is um, a person who has served in the armed forces and who is entitled to compensation for a service-connected disability of at least 50% under the veteran administration laws or who's entitled to compensation for loss, permanent loss of use of one or both hands or feet or permanent visual impairment of both eyes. Uh, what this bill would do is um, change that definition to specify that the definition of disabled veteran for just the purposes of obtaining this d distinctive license plate uh, shall only apply to those veterans with a service connected to physical disability producing limited mobility of at least 50%. With that, I'd be happy to stand for any questions. Are there questions for the reviser? Representative Proctor. Um, thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, in the statute, does it uh, talk at all about privileges for parking or handicap parking or anything like that uh, in connection with this with this tag? Yeah, so the, the tag um, provides some parking privileges that uh, they can park in any handicapped space or zone or, or metered zone with no time limit or uh, parking without charge in a public parking facility handicapped space. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Further questions? Thank you. I'd recognize uh, Representative Burkamp. Is he uh, in the... Yeah, there you are. C couldn't see you. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman and members of the committee. As you referenced, my name is Brian Burkamp, and I'm representative of House District 93. Uh, and I was approached last year by one of my constituents to bring forward this bill. And so after I went to visit him at the VA, I decided it was a worthy cause to try and come up and um, make hopefully a small change that can benefit everybody. When I went to visit him at the, the VA hospital in Wichita, you know, I had a difficult time finding parking there because uh, it's a very busy facility. Uh, which for me is not a big deal, uh, but the issue for him and for others in his situation is that um, oftentimes he can't find a handicapped parking spot because they're all taken up. So for him, uh, being in a wheelchair, he's having to maybe park four or five, six blocks away um, while some of the parking spots being utilized up front for handicap are people who are fully mobile due to the current statute. So our thought process is that we could maybe tweak the statute a little bit to where um, it would target people who are specifically, um, you know, limited mobility to utilize those spots. Because to me, that's the fair thing to do. Now, maybe we can address some of the other um, things that come along with it. But to me, the spirit of the law would be if you're limited mobility, you should have a parking spot <laughs> up front. And in my testimony, I just, I did include for um, the average citizen what they consider a, a person with a disability, what those um, definitions are. And with that, I'll stand for any questions. Does anyone have any, any questions? Representative Delpardang. 
Thank you, Mr. Chair, and thank you for being here. <clears throat> I don't know if this question will be directed at you or maybe the revisor, but I'm gonna I'm gonna throw it out. But I sat on the Military and Veteran Affairs Committee in 2017 to 18 timeframe, and I remember we specifically ran this through because at the time there was a disabled tag and there was a veteran tag, but there was not two. So we put this forward so we could have a disabled veteran tag so they're recognized as a, a veteran, but it was not meant to be a disabled veteran, but rather I'm disabled and I'm a veteran. So is that what the concern is that it's, are we trying to change the meaning of this tag or is there issues that I cannot, cannot park in certain areas or? My understanding for like the revisor and the VA, how they're doing it today is the tag gives you permission to park in a handicap spot. So it gives you full privilege. And that's full what privileges. it was meant to do at the time. I'm not sure what the original yeah, because there was, was not a disabled person tag for a veteran, so they wanted something where they could have both recognitions. So, Representative Proctor, thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, and this may be for you, or it may be for the revisor as well. Um, the is there a uh, cost discount associated either with the the fees or with the tax on uh, getting a tag, a disabled veterans tag versus getting a regular veterans tag or getting a regular Kansas tag? Yeah, my, my understanding is there's no tag fee, but you still pay the regular taxes on your vehicle. And uh, what is that tag fee, do you know? It's or 30 to revisor? $100 or something in there. I'm not positive. Advisor. Yes, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, so yeah, he's correct in that there is no charge for the initial license plate. Uh, I believe for any additional plates, it's $40. Okay. Uh, which you. is the same distinctive license plate fee. Thank you. Representative Weigel. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, I'm, I'm trying to understand. You, you want to have a plate that's specific to a percentage of a person of a, a veterans that's disabled is that what you're going for yes yeah, so i think what needs to happen i mean in my mind is for the statute to be narrowed more specifically to be service members who are limited mobility to qualify for the placard so that only individuals who are limited mobility can park in a handicapped parking spot similar to what it is for non-service members. Okay. Because right now, if, if per the statute, if you qualify, I think over 50% of the VA standards, so whether that's PTSD or other maybe psychological um, issues, you can qualify for a placard even though you have no limited mobility, so to speak. So, so uh, as I am understand what you're saying, you're, you're saying uh, disability of, of up to 50%, correct, or, or more, but it has to be, the, the stipulation is they have to actually be, uh, I don't know what would be the term, not, not mobile like a person that has no uh, mobility issues. Is, is that what you're saying? Yes, yeah, so correct. So it'd be probably more referencing the current statute for, you know, somebody like you and I who's not military where you can only walk 100 feet or you need oxygen assistance or visually impaired, et cetera. Okay. Um, and how is that going to be designated on that plate? I, I'm not 100% certain if it will still be the same license plate, but it's just a more restricted number of people who would be eligible, the way it's written right now for that plate. So, so it's not so much on the plate. It's when you apply for the plate, you have to show 50% or more disability Correct. So during the application process, it's right, right now more are eligible than maybe what certain individuals feel should qualify for that placard plate. Uh, as a person that's written a few tickets in their day, uh, what I see happening is, is regardless of what kind of uh, uh, handicap plate they have, a lot of times you will see people that drive up in fact, I saw one last night uh, going home at a, at a uh, shopping uh, grocery store. Uh, they, get, they pull in there, 
and nobody else is in the vehicle. It was a truck with a handicap plate, jumps out, and he gets into the store quicker than me. And he was probably half my age. So that, that's what you see happening uh, when you say that they can't find a park space, is that they're going up there to visit somebody or they're making a, a uh, quick trip to get uh, milk or something, and they're just going to be in and out, and they leave, but they're the, the person that's in that vehicle, and a lot of times it's just them. It, it's a person that has actually no physical disabilities whatsoever. So I, I'm just throwing that out there. That that's that's what I've seen over the years, and I continue to see that. And and until we figure out some way to uh, either educate those people not to do that or increase the fines when when you see somebody do that, I, I don't know what the answer would be. I, I just put that out there. So yeah, and thank to you. expand really quick, just I think another thing at the VA is that since a lot of veterans do work at the hospital. Um, and do qualify under the current exemption, they might be in a spot all day long as opposed to only five or 10 minutes. So then it's that vehicle is not moving, even though, um, yeah, so it's just tying up that spot the whole day. Representative Proctor. Uh, thank you for indulging me, Mr. Chairman. Um, the, so your bill is, is drafted now, says it has to be a physical disability. Is that correct? Correct. So if a person were missing an arm or a hand, that's a physical disability that wouldn't necessarily limit their mobility, but would allow them to get this tag. Is that correct? I'd have to look under the specific definition because I believe if, um, I don't know how many limbs it takes necessarily on your hands, but it would fall under, I think, the current definition for, and the revisor might know as well. Advisor Wagner? Uh, yes, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, yeah, if you look at the last kind of line in 8160, uh, it still includes in the definition for people who have permanent loss of use of one or both hands or feet. So, uh, yes, yeah, so I, I understand exactly what you're trying to do, and I, I support what you're trying to do. I just think that uh, excluding a whole class of disabled veteran uh, in order to do it because, you know, traumatic brain injury is, a, is you know, classified as a brain injury, not as, I guess, physical ailment, uh, PTSD. I mean, there, people get this license plate for reasons other than just um, the, to get a good parking spot. So I hope that we can come back around and figure out how to narrowly tailor this to what you're trying to do without, uh, I don't know, creating a second class disabled veteran that doesn't qualify for the tag. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Further questions? Representative Ballard. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I think maybe rep the other representative did explain that maybe better than, oh, I'm not sure what the question is. But right now, if you have a disability, you can get like a placard that's 10 inches, I think it's 10 inches long, and you can put that on your mirror. Okay, which would allow you to park in a disabled um, spot. Okay, so, but you want a license plate. The, I believe the current statute allows the individual to get a license plate that's permanent. And so we're looking at maybe restricting the people who are eligible for that license plate on a permanent basis. And then the license plate serves similar to the placard that would hang so from your So the license your mirror. plate would say disabled on it? I, I don't know specifically what the license plate See, I, says. I guess what my question is, if I get a license plate that says veteran, let's just say that, and then I have the placard that's hanging there, then most people should know this is a veteran and they're disabled. Right? So... How would just having the tag be add any more to it in addition to the placard is what I'm not sure of. What I mean, my understanding is that it'd be similar to somebody who had a permanent handicap tag on their vehicle. And this would be the same for a military veteran. They just have a permanent tag as opposed to having that plus a placard. Because there, there's no need for a placard in your vehicle if you have a tag that indicates you're permanently disabled. Okay, 
that's what I thought you might respond. But then what happens if that person happens to be in another car? I mean, do you have to get two tags so you would have it for both of your cars so that you would be covered where if the plaque you can just take out from one car to the next and go? I'm not positive how they handle it. My guess is they might have a, a secondary tag like that that they can take with them. I'm not positive, though. That's just a guess. Okay. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Representative Proctor. I promise this is the last time for this witness uh, or uh, uh, testimony. Um, and this is really a comment to the previous representative. Um, what's the, the tag already exists. The disabled veteran tag already exists. And what's unique about the tag, uh, which would make it different than somebody who had a veteran's tag and then the placard hanging from the rearview mirror, is the disability is service connected. It means that this service member uh, you know, was disabled while serving and defending his nation. And so, uh, you know, I've got a ton of disabled veterans in, in my district. I'm actually, I have service-connected disability as well and would qualify for this tag, but I don't have this tag. Um, uh, and for those folks, this is, uh, this is like the Bronze Star tag bill that we heard. You know, they, they sacrificed and became injured while serving their nation, uh, maybe not in combat, but you know, uh, or maybe in combat. You know, either way, that's what uh, qualifies them for the tag: is that they have a disability in connection with their service to their nation, and that's why they get the tag. And um, I didn't even know until we got this bill that it allowed you to park in the handicapped spot. So, thank you, Mr. Chair. Any further questions? So is that a tag that you're going to attach to the license plate, or will it come on the license plate, and then you don't need the placard? That's why I'm not sure. May I answer, Mr. Chair? Sure. Yeah, the, the current, the, there is a tag already, and it says disabled, and it says veteran at the bottom. So there, the, this tag already exists. It's a, it's a license plate. It is a, it's, it is a... It is a whole license plate dedicated to disabled veterans, and it says disabled on it, and it says veteran on it. And then the, the regular disabled tag just doesn't say veteran. So. Okay, I appreciate that, because when you say tag, I think yeah, it's, I apologize. it's here that yeah. you put on to, that you attach to the license plate, but it's yeah. a license plate. I, I apologize for creating confusion. No, no, Represent. thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you very much. Next proponent I have is uh, Mark Stever. Uh, paralyzed Veterans of America, and he's uh, with us remotely. Welcome to the committee. Thank you very much. Can you can you hear me okay? Yes, sir, I can. Wonderful. Thank you. I really appreciate the opportunity to, uh, to chime in to this. Uh, my name is Mark Stever, and I work at the VA, and I work for the Paralyzed Veterans of America. I am a veteran, and I've been in uh, a wheelchair. I am a paraplegic and I've been in a wheelchair for over 20 years. This, this, I really took a lot of special interest into this, this law when it first came about. Um, I did provide, provide a written testimony to this, but I'm going to read it. It is a short paragraph um, that I've watched the liberation of the granting of handicap placards to veterans who have a 50% disability, regardless of whether or not the disability produces limited mobility. Uh, the liberation of this requirement ha has defeated the purpose of a handicapped parking and should be should not be used as a, as a tool or to be uh, should not be used should not be a tool used in effort to be pro-veteran or to win votes during a voting year. What has happened with this liberation, what I've watched is Many veterans come to the VA who have limited mobility and cannot find a parking spot because they're competing with veterans who have PTSD. Or another example is, because I, I, I process claims, uh, sleep apnea is a, it's a disability that where you basically you snore at night, you have restricted breathing, and you require a CPAP machine to sleep. That is a 50% disability. I've watched many applications come through for a handicap placard just because they sleep with a, a, a CPAP machine. Uh, and they're competing. And so you have veterans who have, you know, I have power of attorney 
on about 200 paraplegics and quadriplegics that come in for their appointment and a, 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 a VA employee who's a veteran who comes into work at seven o'clock in the morning has already taken most of the spots. Uh, I, you know, I personally witnessed one uh, veteran who I know is, he's 100% service connected, but he has no limited mobility. And I literally watched him run out of building 61 to his truck to get his cigarettes, run off campus to have a smoke. There's no limited mobility there. And when, when my veterans come in, or even myself, and they, and they have to park clear out by the flagpole, you know, especially on inclement weather days, that's, that's uh, very challenging. Uh, you know, when this, this also, I wanna also address the, uh, the tag issue and the placard issue. I believe that it's my understanding that you can get a disabled tag that goes on your primary vehicle. You're also issued the placard to go in the glove box of your secondary vehicle, whether it's, you know, you, if it's your spouse's vehicle, that way you have both and uh, the, the, uh, you're still able to utilize handicapped parking. Um, the, when this law first came into, uh, personally, I'd love to see this law go back to the original statutes, period. Uh, but when this first came up, the representative a few years ago was Pete DeGraff, and I spoke with a few others. One of them was a freshman that told me that he was originally going to vote it down. But he, he stated that he was cornered by a couple of seniors who told him that uh, voting down would, look, uh, would not look pro-veteran. It would be political suicide. You can be, you know, pro-veteran and patriotic all you want. But allowing veterans to take a handicap spot when they do not have limited mobility is taken away from the veterans and citizens who desperately need those handicap spots. And I just, I thank you for your time to be able to chime into this. Uh, that's all I've had to have to, to say or add. Are there any questions for Mr. Stever? Are there any questions online for Mr. Stever? See none. Thank you very much. Wait a minute. I'm sorry. Representative Howe. Yeah. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Mr. Stevers, if I pronounced that correctly. Uh, do you know how many uh, handicapped parking spots are available there at the VA hospital in Wichita? I do not have that number, but I can get it from you. I know that they, uh, the VA uh, is actually above standards uh, as what's required by the state of Kansas. So, uh, I'm just throwing out some uh, bogus numbers, but if they were required to have 50 uh, handicapped parking spaces, they have 75. They've actually went over and above the standard on that. And uh, I've been working for the PVA 17 years, and I can personally tell you that every one of those handicapped parking spaces are taken by at least 8 o'clock in the morning. So if a veteran has a, a mid-morning or, or a late afternoon appointment, they're going to be trolling around the parking lot looking for that space. Yeah, th thank you for the answer. And uh, I, you work at the Dole VA, is that correct? Yes, I work in a regional office. I also want to add earlier, when a, a veteran completes an application for a disabled handicap placard or disabled ta uh, veterans tag, that application goes to the VA director, regional office director. And uh, Donna Hinkle Meyer, she actually has to review the veterans rating and see what their service connected for. If they actually, what the, what the current law is, that they're just 50%. Um, and then she actually is the one that signs off on the application approving the handicap placard. Now, this, the, the uh, issue of VA employees taking all the handicap spots has been addressed with the director's office as well. And it was asked that, can they ask their employees not to take those spots and leave them for the veterans? They had responses from HR and also the union that no, they cannot because that would be discrimination. Uh, so they're, they're not even able to, to uh, have the, the VA employees park, you know, in employee parking areas or, 
or someone for, somewhere further out. Thank you for your testimony today. And uh, I, I appreciate Representative Burkamp for identifying an issue that hopefully we can find a solution to. Um, I'm not sure uh, what that is, but I, I had had a general thought. Um, perhaps we need to um, formulate a plan to have valet parking at all VA hospitals. Uh, I think that could serve a need in, in many ways. It sounds maybe a little outlandish because it would have to have buy-in from the, the, the federal VA system, but I, I think there could be something to that. Representative Proctor. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, for the reviser, um, what in this bill constitutes physical? That, that sleep apnea example, would that be a physical disability in this in the bill as it's currently written? Uh, yes, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, physical isn't defined in the bill. Um, it's linked to producing limited mobility, uh, you know, so that could be the qualifier on what you know. So is that in this? Is that in the bill now, or it would uh, in the bill? Yeah, it adds. Uh, for service-connected physical disability producing limited mobility. Okay. All right. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Representative Seigert. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. What was this uh, previous speaker? What, I don't want to mispronounce his name. Stever. The, Mr. Stever. Mr. Stevers. Is he still there? Yes, I am. I want to thank you for bringing this up because this has been, you know, this is a very sensitive, typical our topic. Uh, because of that. And a lot of places that have handy parking spaces are facing the same thing. And I appreciate you bringing it up because there's so many people take advantage of those things that really aren't. And I have a nephew that's in a wheelchair. I don't know how many number of times that he's had to park in a parking lot because somebody gets out and runs into the building in a handicapped parking spot. And he is in a handicapped wheelchair. But it takes a lot of courage for you to stand up and say this, that some are and some are not. And I appreciate that very much because this is an issue at a number of businesses and restaurants and everything that people are misusing those spots when there are people that direly need those spots. And I appreciate you taking a stand on this. Thank you. Thank you. Ballard. I think I'm passing. Okay. Because we're, we're, I'm not sure about that. Well, well, I will just comment on it. I rather like the idea of valet parking. I mean, I do. But how, you know, and you probably would be able to find people that would be willing to donate and support it, you know, because of the service. But how do you make a distinction? Because if I have a disability and I, you know, and I'm there, but I don't have the right tag, they'll say, no, you don't qualify. Then there's somebody else who would. Now you've created another problem. All right, that's all I wanted to say. I kind of okay. like the idea, but then I, I got a little confused about, well, you start turning away people, and now that's worse. Thank you. Seeing no further comments, uh, I don't have anyone else listed as a proponent. Does anyone else wish to speak as a proponent? Seeing none, I have listed as an opponent by remote uh, Captain Retired Curtis Hervey. Welcome to the committee. Captain Hervey, are you there? Okay, so we'll consider that written testimony at this point in time. Uh, uh, Colonel U.S. Air Force, retired Mike Kelly, are you on or is he yours? Welcome to the committee. Didn't see you over there. Mr. Chairman, honorable members of the committee, thank you. Um, first, I want to congratulate Representative Burkamp for his constituent service and listening to his veterans that are in his district. Um, I understand the frustrations with this law, or with this bill, I should say, and the frustration with people that misbehave and abuse privileges. I understand all of those things. And it makes me angry when somebody who's able to walk well 
parks in a place where my 90 year old father who's got very limited mobility needs to park. I get, I get that very much. However, I think the approach that's um, in this bill language is flawed. And so I stand in opposition and my group stands in opposition. Now my group is the Military Officers Association of America, Kansas Council of Chapters. We have six chapters. We have one in Wichita, Manhattan, Topeka, Lawrence, Johnson County, and Leavenworth. And we're part of a national organization that advocates for military members, their family members, and those that have served in the past. So that's, where, that's how we approach this. There's some confusion about disabled veteran license plate versus a standard disabled plate. The standard disabled plate, there's a form 159 and it lists six medical conditions and a doctor or a podiatrist or an optometrist has to sign that form in order to get a standard disabled plate in the state of Kansas. And to represent Ballard's question, that's also how you get the hang tag, that 10 inch placard that hangs on your rearview mirror. You get that with the form 159. And um, that's prescribed by the Kansas Department of Revenue, the vehicle um, licensing section. And I didn't use their bureaucrat or their administrative name properly, but I think I know who, you're, who I'm referring to. To get this plate, which has the word disabled veteran at the bottom, and has the wheelchair handicap symbol to the viewer's left of the tag number, uh, you fill out a form 103. And the 103, as the previous witness correctly described, goes to the regional office of the VA, and the regional director of the VA, VA has to confirm that the person applying has a service-connected disability rated at 50% or more. So nobody's get, getting one of these tags without having a serious disability. Now, there are disabilities that are serious for conditions other than walking from a parking space into the grocery store, but they're still serious disabilities. And I don't believe we should create different classes of veterans based on the seriousness or, or excuse me, or the, the categorization of their disability. Veterans who have problems that aren't related to their ability to walk still have serious problems and they are compensated by the federal government for that. The process that governs that is codified in the Code of Federal Regulations, Title 38, Book C, and it's a big book. It goes through every medical condition. It goes through every part of the human body. It's not divided as physical and non-physical. So the taxonomy that this bill creates doesn't match up with the federal process to determine a veteran's disability. So if the state were to adopt this bill and make it a law, then the state would have to undergo some rulemaking and look at this book C of Title 38 of the Code of Federal Regulations, go through every one of those conditions and the rating factors for every one of those conditions, and decides which ones count for this law. So in effect, you're re-adjudicating a disability claim of a veteran. That can be a lot of work and can be quite complicated. Some individuals may feel like that's discriminatory. And the previous witness correctly pointed out that the VA employees can't be prohibited from using their handicap rights. And I believe the reason for that, and I'm not a lawyer, but I'm gonna believe that it's related to Section 504 of the Rehabilitation Act of 1973 which prohibits discrimination against disabled individuals using federally funded facilities. Well, as this committee knows, there's a lot of federal dollars that go into automobile related infrastructure in this country. And so I think a lawyer could create a nexus between federally funded 
and um, someone being denied uh, parking in, in a facility that got some federal funds. The veteran would have to disclose their medical conditions to the Department of Revenue or to the county treasurer under this bill. I think that's an affront to their privacy. They've already gone through a federally uh, described adjudication process to get their disability rating. That should be enough. The fact that some people abuse it, some people drive in their, you know, their uncle was a veteran and they drive with his handicap plate and they run into the grocery store. Yeah, that's reprehensible. I agree. But, but this bill is not the answer to represent reprehensible behavior by a few individuals. I've been involved in, I mean, I, I'm a volunteer in Lawrence for the public schools. I have painted handicapped parking spaces at schools in Lawrence. I've had the blue paint out there and the stencil and marked the lines myself. And I pointed out our local school passed a bond issue and they expanded the parking lot, but they didn't expand the number of handicapped parking spaces. I did the research in the Americans with Disabilities Act and that prescribes if you have a parking lot with so many spaces, so many have to be handicapped. There's a, you know, federal regulations that uh, are enacted under that law. And I believe, I haven't been to Wichita facility, I've been to the Topeka VA facility, and I agree with the gentleman who previously testified that the VA goes above and beyond the ADA requirements. They have way more handicapped spaces for the size of their parking lot than are required by the law. So I don't think the, the VA's um, painting of the parking spaces is a problem. I think the valet solution is a, is a good idea. Our Lawrence Hospital has a valet service for people that pull up in the parking there. Uh, and I think that's, that's great. Um, but somebody has to pay for that. And, and as is indicated previously, the payment uh, is a, it's a federal problem for the VA. My group, when we were discussing our response to this bill, said we should come with a suggestion and we should try and work to improve the bill and not just be naysayers. Um, right now, I'm certainly willing to work with Representative Burkamp or any other proponents of this bill uh, to try and find a way to make this better. But dividing veterans based on one type of disability versus another type of disability and invading their privacy is not the answer. One other situation I'd like you to bring up, like to bring up for you is someone who has service-connected disabilities and then subsequently has, in their retired life, has um, a serious orthopedic injury. And so suddenly they don't have the VA rating for their orthopedic injury, but they're limited. Well, they can file the Form 159 and get a disabled plate, a standard disabled plate, if, if they're in that situation. So, so there are ways for um, folks to get disabled preferences for accessible parking. Uh, I don't think Kansas has got a problem there, um, but the problem of people behaving badly is not to be solved by pitting one set of veterans against another. Mr. Chairman, I thank you for your patience with my testimony and I stand, stand for any questions from any of the members. Are there any questions? Hearing none, thank you. Thank, thank you very you, much. Mr. Chairman. I have no other opponents or neutrals listed. Does anyone else wish to speak as an opponent or a neutral? Seeing none, we'll close the hearing on House Bill 2504 and open the hearing on House Bill 2594. Reviser Wagner. Yes, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Committee House Bill 2594. 
um, exempt certain modifications on antique vehicles uh, from the statute that provides procedures for VIN number offenses, um, seizures, and dispositions. KSA 8-116 provides procedures for when a vehicle's VIN has been destroyed, removed, altered, or defaced. Uh, under the statute, it's unlawful for anyone to sell, exchange, knowingly own, or have custody of a motor vehicle with a VIN that has been destroyed, removed, altered, or defaced, uh, when no part of the vehicle has been stolen and the VIN has been assigned to the vehicle. Um, there are certain exceptions provided um, in statute for assembled or reconstructed vehicles. Um, and every law enforcement having knowledge of a vehicle with a defective VIN is directed to seize and take possession of the vehicle and that vehicle is classified as an article of contraband. Uh, what this bill would do is create an ex exemption under that statute uh, specifically for antique vehicles as they're defined. Uh, so any vehicle that is 35 years or older uh, the exemption would allow for the removal and reinstallation of a serial number or VIN on an antique vehicle if the removal is reasonably necessary for repair or restoration of the antique vehicle. This exemption would not apply if the person knows or has reason to know that the antique vehicle is stolen. And with that, I'd be happy to answer any questions. Are there any questions for the reviser? See none, thank you. Thank you. Now recognize uh, Representative uh, Vice Chair Del Bourdain, uh, and I'm allowing him to stay in his seat right here to, to do this. Uh, Representative Del Bourdain. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, if you guys remember a week or two, is I was one that introduced this bill. Um, so anyway, I just I've also provided a handout of, with of a, an article of with a Corvette on it, and that's what brought this to my attention. Uh, I was out at the uh, SEMA organization meeting last November and I got cornered by a couple of guys out there of this was going down so I'd, I'd never heard of it prior to and I have not reached out to the individual on in the the write-up on it um, but just a brief one on that in in the case of that specific Corvette and we are not going after this one with this bill I, I believe it's too late to make a difference on that that's just my opinion but in this case the individual bought a fully restored Corvette in Indiana from a dealership with a clear title. When he brought that vehicle into Kansas, it had to be gone through, produced or went through the uh, Kansas Highway Patrol uh, vehicle inspection process. During the process, they noticed that there was the wrong type of rivets on the VIN plate, and the VIN plate had been removed because of damage, uh, I want to say rust, but it's Corvette's a fiberglass body, so I don't know that specific area, but it was damaged, it was documented, it was then replaced, and, but it was done with the wrong type of, of rivets. Um, so as a result of that and some other parts on the car, it was confiscated from the owner who had paid roughly fifty, sixty thousand dollars $60,000 from this vet from a dealership, and it still to this day sits in a warehouse here in Topeka and it is cons it's going through the courts, but it is considered contraband. And per current statutes, you will destroy contraband. So that's what we're looking at on this. So it kind of got me looking into it a little bit further. So, and with that, uh, I, I did a write up on here. Uh, just like to let, give you a testimony, but I am asking for your support for the law, which would remove unnecessary restrictions concerning the. Rec uh, currently required for antique vehicles. And I'm gonna stress antique because if we get into brand new vehicles or ones that are you know a few years old, hands off. If your VIN's been altered, something's going on here. So I'm looking strictly at the antique market. Uh, so I'm just gonna jump ahead, but currently the statutes do not allow for the removal of VIN plates, even if necessary for damage or rust repairs. The statutes do say that a motor vehicle with a VIN that has been removed, abused, or defaced is automatically deemed contraband and subject to the rules of forfeiture and destruction. When considering this on newer vehicles, again, I'd, I'd, I'd hands off on the thing, but however, I think there needs to be some exceptions to the rules in the case of an antique vehicle being defined as 35 years or older, there can be extensive repairs required 
to return the vehicle back to its original state. The repairs frequently require access to areas where a VIN plate may be attached. And in doing this uh, bill, I'm, I'm looking for the following concerns. The, the changes, it changes current statutes to allow vehicles registered as antique, the reasonable removal and reinstallation of vehicle ID numbers if the act is necessary for a restoration or repair. It acknowledges that the restoration experts nationwide commonly refer, rely on the practice of a temporarily VIN removal to achieve some of these restorations and the, and the refinishing. It also allows enthusiasts to protect their rights to thoroughly restore a vehicle into an award-winning condition without the fear of being prosecuted for tampering with a VIN. And it recognizes that the collection and restoration of historic and classic cars is an important part of preserving the technological achievements and our cultural heritage in the U.S. And with that, I would be more than happy to stand for any questions. Are there questions for Represent Representative Ho Heisel? Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Representative or Vice Chair, for uh, bringing this to us today. One quick question. Are we defining um, antique vehicles and this is 35 years old? Yes, sir. Okay. Um, and they have to be registered as an antique vehicle? Or is it? Any I'm not going to say it has to be registered in antique because that's up to you. If you if you've got a 35 year old vehicle, you're qualified, but you may want it registered normal. It's not something I'm going to. And force this would in. cover if it's registered normally as well. That would. Be I believe so, and if I'd be happy to refer to the revisor if I'm wrong on that one. Revisor Wagner. Yeah. So the bill states that it would be an antique vehicle as defined in that statute um, wouldn't necessarily require a registration. I don't think it, it's just defined under that statute. Okay, so it could be as long as it's older than 35 years old, it would be covered. Okay. And uh, just want to make it clear to the committee that last time we did an antique bill, you guys got a lot of emails from me and the emails you're getting are not from me this time. So that, that's my you can blame the vice time. chairman apologize, this time, but, but yeah. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Representative Howe. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Vice Chairman uh, Delperding, do you know, since this car was acquired in Indiana, was it from a licensed dealer that would have been insured? Uh, I, I guess I'm trying to figure out who would be, does the state of Kansas take the position that um, this dealer would be liable for damages because of the sale, or who would you know, this guy bought the vehicle, but is he just out $50,000 or would the state have to pay him back for destroying it? I mean, in, in the case, and I'll, I'll say this one more time, in the case of this vehicle, it may be too late for, it's, it's, this happened a few years ago, but it is still in the courts uh, and it's going through it. So I don't want to do something that's going to mess whatever the court case is. But in this case, I did specifically talk to the highway patrol. And the question I asked was, if, first off, it came from a licensed dealer. Yes, it did. It came with a clear Indiana title from the licensed dealer. But since the VIN has been removed and replaced, it is considered contraband. So I asked the highway patrol, can we, first off, do you consider the person who purchased it guilty? The answer was no, we do not. We know he was acting with best intent that, of his knowledge. So can we go ahead and have the vehicle returned to the dealer in Indiana? And the answer was no, it is considered contraband. So we are not sending it back. I mean, if you think about it, it's kind of being treated similar to a drug seizure. It's contraband. So, and, and, I, and I'll, just, I'll just also put the comment out there that again, may not be able to affect this one, but moving forward, I'm thinking something has to be changed there. Are there further questions? Seeing none, uh, committee, I would bring to your attention a written testimony in support of House Bill 2594 by Christian Robinson. Um, does anyone else wish to speak as a proponent? Committee, I have written testimony only uh, in opposition by the Kansas Highway Patrol, 
and you have that in front of you. Does anyone else wish to speak as an opponent or neutral? Seeing none, we'll close the hearing on House Bill 25. I'm sorry, Representative Seiwert. Sure. Just out of curiosity, I'm sorry, I'm just beyond belief that they could do this to this vehicle that passed everything but that screws in the plate. Isn't there usually two identification numbers? And if I read this thing right, there was one on the frame that indicated it was the right vehicle. So how could they possibly say the one in the stamp frame was not the same vehicle other than the way the screws were? Okay. Typically in, in a, a vehicle of this age, if there's question on the VIN plate, they go after the serial numbers, which is on the engine that should match. In this case, the vehicle is restored. It does not have the original engine. Okay. The numbers do not match. Okay. Thank you. Representative Proctor. Sorry to bog this down, uh, Mr. Chair. I've got a question for the revisor. Um, so when you've taken the, it, uh, under this bill, if it becomes statute, when you've taken the plate off and you're in the middle of the restoration of the vehicle before you put the plate on, does the, is the vehicle contraband until you get the VIN back on, the plate back on? Mr. Wagner. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. So the the exemption created apply it makes the statute not apply to a person who removes and reinstalls. So both would seem to be required to to have the exemption. So we may need to, to just as a comment, we may need to do something because sometimes sandblasting, priming, painting can take weeks, months, and if you're a hobbyist, years. Um, and in the meantime, you know, you I guess you got to hide it from the law until you get the VIN tag back on. So maybe we can figure out a way to change the language so that in that interim period, it's still okay. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you. Yes, I, I appreciate the question. And I will follow up with uh, Chris here to possibly run an amendment on this as we run it through to cover that issue on it. So appreciate it. Any further comments or questions? Seeing none. Uh, Again, I, I have nobody listed as opposition or, or neutral uh, other than the written that I've already uh, indicated. Does anyone else wish to speak there? Seeing none, we'll close the hearing on House Bill 2594 and open the hearing on House Bill 2595. Revisor Wagner. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Committee House Bill 2595 would make certain certificate of title procedures for antique vehicles applicable to vehicles with a model year prior to or after 1960 rather than uh, 1950. 8-170 uh, provides procedures for the registration and titling of an antique vehicle. Uh, statute uh, provides that a person may apply for an antique vehicle certificate of title using a bill of sale to approve ownership of the vehicle. If using a bill of sale to prove ownership, uh, if the antique vehicle has a model year prior to 1950, uh, then the bill of sale and application for title is sufficient to obtain that title. If the model year of the antique vehicle is 1950 or later, then additionally the applicant must get an inspection by the Kansas Highway Patrol um, to obtain the title. What this bill would do is make those titling procedures the kind of the operative year 1960 uh, rather than 1950. So the effect would be that an antique vehicle with a model year prior to 1960 will not be required to have a KHP inspection. Any vehicle after that model year will have to have a, an inspection uh, when using a bill of sale to, to get a, a certificate of title. With that, I'd be happy to answer any questions. Are there any questions? Representative Proctor. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, so currently under statute, if it's between 1950 and 1960 and you have a title uh, and you're transferring title like uh, you've sold the vehicle to somebody, is a, is a VIN inspection required right now if you have the title? I don't believe so when you're using the title as the ownership document. Okay. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Any further questions? Representative Tim uh, Minix. 
Thank you. Um, I have a question about if if I have a 1956 vehicle and I take it in and they run the VIN inspection on it currently and they find some parts on that vehicle that have been stolen, isn't that contraband? I believe it would, yeah. If Well, if it... Yes. Would, would that vehicle be impounded also? I believe with your... If I'm understanding the question, then yeah, I think it would be thrown into that kind of statute we were just discussing. Or any vehicle, didn't have to be in the 50s. Any vehicle that is inspected and found uh, stolen parts on it, we, we get back to the same issue we were at with this past bill. Thank you. Representative Delper Dang. Thank you, Mr. Chair. And I, I feel free to jump in this too, Chris. But if I'm selling a vehicle and it's got some stolen parts, the question is how do I relate them back as being stolen? For example, I've got a VIN number. I may have a serial number on an engine, but if I'm replacing glass seats, doors, whatever, they're not going to necessarily have any identification to prove it is stolen. I mean, And sorry, if I, I could, uh, Mr. Chair, one example, Mr. Vice Chair, one, one example is like uh, engines and Corvettes, they're stamped with a VIN and it may, and you know, you may have to like swap engines because the engine blew that I, I have heard of people who've had the case where they check the VIN on the vehicle and they check the VIN on the engine and the engine was stolen or the car that the engine was in was stolen. So that, that and they impound your car. <laughs> so I actually noticed why that happened too. Representative Minix, do you have something else? Well, I don't have an answer to that, but it's something that we might consider in, in both the, the most recent bill and this one as we proceed forward. Representative Weigel. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. To answer your question, if they find something on that vehicle that's stolen, they're, they're not going to just take that part off of it or whatever it is. They're going to take the car. That's just that's the way it's done, at least it's my, in my experience. And uh, I don't, as far as I know, I've been out of that for some time now, but I don't think that's changed any. So thank you. Any other questions for the reviser? Seeing none, thank you, Chris. I, saw, I show no proponents listed. Does anyone wish to speak as a proponent? Hearing none, I have uh, one written opposition by the Kansas Highway Patrol. Does anyone else wish to speak as an opponent or as a neutral? Seeing none, we'll close the hearing on House Bill 2595. Open the hearing on House Bill 2596. Provisor Wagner, you're getting a workout today. Yes, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Committee House Bill 2596 authorizes the Board of Education of a school district to contract with transportation network companies to provide certain transportation services. Uh, KSA 8 2701. Uh, and the, the entire act is the Kansas Transportation Network Company Services Act. This act pro outlines procedures and requirements for TNCs. Uh, so think, you know, it's an Uber Lyft type company to operate in the state. Uh, there are various requirements for TNCs uh, contained in the act relating to, for example, mandatory insurance coverage, uh, TNC driver applications and qualifications and how to display and convey certain information to uh, TNC writers. Uh, what this bill would, would do is authorize the Board of Education of a school district to contract with one of those companies uh, for transportation services of eight passengers or fewer to and from school and school-related activities. Uh, the Kansas TNC Act will be applicable to these types of transactions uh, and the contract between the school district and the TNC may establish additional requirements uh, beyond the act. The TNC shall also be required under this bill to um, get any TNC drivers who would perform services under the contract with the school district to um, 
undergo a criminal history record check pursuant to 75, KSA 75-712-I, which is a statute that provides um, an, a procedure for quali certain qualified entities, uh, which are entities that would have access to super or supervised, unsupervised access to children um, as one part that they could um, request the KBI perform a, a background check. And additionally, the bill states that the TNC Act and the contract between the district and the TNC shall exclusively govern these transactions and uh, State Board of Education rules and regulations will not apply. And with that, I'd be happy to answer any questions. Are there any questions for the reviser? Seeing none, thank you. I have listed as proponent, uh, Tricia Donahue. Welcome to the committee. Chairman and committee members, thank you for having me this afternoon. My name is Trish Donahue. I'm Vice President of Legal and Policy at Hopskip Drive. We are a transportation network company designed specifically for children and other individuals who need additional support during rides. We were founded seven years ago by three working moms looking to solve their own challenges. Um, I am now also a working mom of a six month old and I'm already going, oh my gosh, how am I gonna get him to and from soccer or karate or gymnastics or whatever he chooses to do? Um, so they created a system with the North Star of the system being, what would it take for me to put my own child in a hop, skip, drive? And so we designed a system of safety standards um, that apply to drivers and also technology enhanced systems as well to ensure ride safety. On the driver side, we require that all drivers with our platform have at least five years of prior caregiving experience. Um, so we're talking about moms from the community, grandparents from the community. We're talking about former nurses, teachers, firefighters. They have to have five prior years of caregiving experience in order to even qualify to drive with us. On top of that, we go through extensive background checks, including fingerprint-based background checks and motor vehicle history searches. And we hold drivers to the same standards that apply to teachers and other caregiving professionals. So if a criminal history search would disqualify a teacher, it'll disqualify a care driver. Um, in terms of technology enhanced safety systems, we have live ride telematics during each ride. The telematics detect at least six different driving behaviors, including speeding, hard braking, and real time de collision detection. So we know as it's occurring if there is a ride anomaly. In addition, we have what's called the safe ride support system. This uses GPS tracking and those telematics to detect anomalies in real time. So we actually have a, sta a team at Hop, Skip, Drive staffed to monitor rides in real time. So they're actually watching rides as they happen and alerts will be generated if a, if a driver is, for example, running five minutes late to the pickup location. We can then intervene and make sure that's communicated to everyone involved. Um, after our founders started this company to help parents, we quickly realized how extensible our service was to schools and county foster agencies in particular. Unfortunately, LA County has the largest foster care system in the country. We are an LA-based uh, business, at least initially. We started contracting with LA County's foster system over four years ago to arrange rides for youth in foster care. Now we are about to launch in our 11th state this month. We have safely arranged rides over 20 million miles in our operation, and we continue to receive outreach from school districts who need a safe and flexible option for certain types of students in particular. Um, take a youth experiencing homelessness. A child experiencing homelessness will move on average three to four times in a school year. That child could move Tuesday night and they need transportation to school Wednesday morning. They don't need to wait two weeks for a school to be you know, rerouted. That's, that's um, incredibly challenging and damaging to that student. A solution like Hop, Skip, Drive can respond so we can get that child to school the next day on Wednesday. Um, this also helps to alleviate the existing bus driver shortage because it means that bus drivers can be dedicated to fully fully optimized routes. Um, so they can be saved for the routes that have 
30, 40, 50, 60 students on the bus. And schools can use hop, skip, drive cars for those sort of one-off transportation needs of, of youth in foster care, students experiencing homelessness, and students with special needs, um, or rural students as well who maybe don't seamlessly fit along a bus route. Um, so with that said, um, we are, of course, supporting 2596. It simply would clarify that we can operate in this state subject to the TNC requirements and additional background check requirements that are stipulated in the bill. Um, it does not mandate that schools work with us. It simply provides them another option during a time of severe bus driver shortages. Um, with that, I will stop there, but I'm happy to address any questions. Other questions for Ms. Donahue? Representative Dale Bourdain. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Appreciate you being here. Thank you. <laughs> Got to meet you earlier today. Just a few questions I wanted to run through. Uh, uh, is there any certain vehicle requirements before they're allowed to drive? From And I'm saying that from a safety perspective. Sure. So all vehicles are four-door sedan or SUV or, or minivan type vehicles. They have seating capacities of eight passengers or less. They cannot be more than 10 model years of age, and they go through, they pass annual vehicle inspections. Okay. And then uh, safeguards and... Pardon? Oh, okay. <laughs> okay. Safeguards. Uh, suppose I, ha I pick up a child and I take them to the ball game and the ball game's canceled. What's the driver to do? In that scenario, you're the, you're the driver? Mm-hmm. Um, that has yet to happen, so that's a, a great hypothetical, but um, riders themselves, a child cannot change um, the, the trajectory of the ride. So, you know, nine-year-old Jimmy can't get in the car and say, you know what, I'd really like you to take me to ice cream instead of going home. Um, so it'd have to be authorized by the individual who requested the ride. So in that situation, what would happen is our team, the Safe Ride Support Team, would call over to the parent or the school district who organized the ride and request what they would like you know, for, for that child if they want to be dropped off at home or somewhere else. Um, we would respond. The app also allows the driver at the click of a button to call the person who organized the ride. Um, and that's a, it's a masked phone number. It's just facilitated through the app. So they could also call, you know, the school district or the parent. Um, the parent can give them instructions, but it's not going to be rerouted and, unless we approve it as well. So is the driver obligated to stay with the child? If, he, Like, say, if he shows up to a ball game and nobody's there, it's been canceled? Oh, absolutely, yeah. We, we, we advertise a door-to-door -door transportation system. And so the request for care drivers, too, is let's say they're, they're even pulling into your driveway to drop Jimmy off that evening. Um, we ask the care driver to wait in the vehicle until they actually see Jimmy enter the home. Um, or in the app too, the, the parent or the school can put notes for how they want that drop off to happen. So they could say, please walk Jimmy to the door. Okay. Uh, are there any camera requirements in the vehicle? And the, what I'm referring to is I get a rowdy kid in there and the driver gets irritated and, hit, and hits the child. What, what do we got for a safeguard there? Sure. So the safeguards, they're largely the preventative measures. Um, these people have five years of prior caregiving experience, oftentimes in other licensed professions that have, you know, reporting obligations and, and those types of requirements to maintain your license. Take a teacher, for example. Um, so coupling the caregiving experience with a name-based background check, a fingerprint-based background check, and in states where we have access to it, we also do child abuse and neglect searches. All of that information should tell us if somebody is a bad actor before they ever join the platform. Um, if an allegation were to ever be made like that, we would very promptly pause that care driver's account, conduct a full investigation. If we find any truth to the allegation, that person is deactiv deactified and, and no longer uh, deactivated and no longer allowed to drive on the platform. And then lastly, the other safeguard is that safe ride support system. Um, so if a care driver were to pull over, for example, during a ride, we would be alerted right away and can intervene. Okay. Is there any special provisions for handicapped children, for example? Sure. So we do a lot of rides for students with disabilities. We do not currently have wheelchair accessible vehicles, but we will contract out for that type of service if requested by a school district. Um, the bulk of the students who really benefit from the hop, skip, drive services, though, are, for example, students with, with autism or a vision impairment. 
Um, take a student with autism who may not perform very well on a school bus because of the sensory overload. That student is much more appropriately and better served in a small SUV where they have a dedicated care driver who has prior caregiving experience and where the notes can say, hey, this student has uh, sensory challenges. Please do not play any music during the ride. That note stays on the child's account so that any time a care driver picks up that child, they see that they should not be playing loud music during a ride. I appreciate you answering it and welcome to Kansas. Thank you. Representative Hal. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. My question is, do your drivers have to be, are they considered mandatory reporters uh, as a teacher would or someone else? Yes, it's generally a contract of, of state law, whether they fall in that definition, but either way, during the driver training process, we communicate that they are mandated reporters. Any other questions? Seeing none, thank you very much. I appreciate it. Thank you for your time. Uh, committee, I, uh, I have no other proponents uh, listed to speak, but we have written testimony from uh, Tori Peterson and uh, John Jenks, and I would bring that to your attention. Uh, I have one opponent listed, uh, Mr. Jim Carl Skint. Welcome to the committee. Thank you, Mr. Chair, and thank you, committee. Uh, committee, looking at the clock, it's three minutes till three. I know you're ready to get out of here quick, so I won't take a lot of time. I, I certainly appreciate the comments that were made by the, uh, the, the proponent regarding the hump, uh, hop, skip, drive uh, issue. My reason for opposing this, and I represent the United School Administrators and others, it's section C of this bill, which states at the last sentence, and all rules and regulations of the State Board of Education concerning the transportation of students shall not apply. You know, I've been in, I was in the business of schools for nearly 40 years. My concern is safety of kids and why is it that the rules of the state board are, are being excluded or being ignored? That, that is my reason for the opposition to this. And so, you know, I'll be happy to stand for questions. Are there questions for Mr. Carl Skin? Hearing none, thank you very much. I appreciate it. Thank you. Committee, I have no one listed as a neutral. Does anyone wish to speak as a neutral? Hearing none, we'll close the hearing on House Bill 2596. Committee, tomorrow we will be meeting uh, and hearing House Bill 2567 and 2597 and plan to work uh, Four bills tomorrow, uh, 25, 2458, 2476, 2478, and 2483. Is there any other business to come before the committee? Representative Minix. I appreciate uh, the chairman sending out an uh, email forward concerning CDLs this morning. If any of you have questions about that, contact me afterwards. I'd be happy to discuss it with you. Thank you. With that, we are adjourned. <laughs>